decade-long mission to scale the world's highest mountains. Our sport is a risky sport. I feel very sure that some people think I am a crazy woman. Two of the five mountaineers are about to have their missions come suddenly to an end in Chasing Mountains after the news. BBC News with David Harper. U.S. Secret Service agents have bundled Donald Trump off stage at an election rally after a series of gunshots were heard. Security teams rushed to protect the former president at the event in Pennsylvania. He raised a fist to his supporters before being taken away in a car. Blood was seen on his ear. Mr. Trump's campaign team said he was fine and had undergone checks at a medical facility. Officials have told U.S. media that the suspected attacker had been killed. President Biden said he was grateful to hear that Donald Trump was safe. In a televised address, he condemned the incident, describing it as sick. Mr. Biden said there was no place for political violence in America. Two former presidents, Barack Obama and George Bush, expressed their relief that Mr. Trump wasn't seriously hurt. In other news, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said there's no proof yet that Israeli airstrikes on Saturday were successful in killing two of the top military leaders of Hamas. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza said more than 90 people were killed. The leading Islamist party in Tunisia, Enada, said its secretary-general had been detained by police. It was not immediately clear why Ajbi Larimi was taken into custody. There has been a recent wave of arrests targeting dozens of journalists, lawyers and political opponents of the hardline president, Kais Syed. Syria has told neighbouring Turkey that normalising relations between the two countries depends on Ankara withdrawing troops from its territory. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said he's considering inviting Syria's President Assad to Ankara to discuss restoring ties. A lawyer for the family of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer shot dead on a US film set three years ago, has condemned the judge's decision to dismiss the case against the actor Alec Baldwin. Gloria Allred said she remained determined to hold Mr. Baldwin accountable for his actions through the civil courts. Live from London, I'm David Harper, and that's the latest BBC News. From the BBC World Service, this is Amazing Sports Stories. Kanchenjunga, the world's third highest mountain, on the border of Nepal and India. Nevis Maroy is crouched beside her husband, Romano. He's lying in the snow, collapsed, the wind menacingly howling around them. She can see he's gravely ill. This is Nevis's 12th of 14 peaks. The summit is within view, and with it, a chance to become the first woman to climb all of the world's 8,000 meter mountains. Four other women are also vying for the title. Nevis is currently neck and neck with a Dernay from the Basque Country and the Austrian climber Gerlinda. Romano is suggesting she goes on without him, not to abandon her chance at the summit. She could get Romano settled at base camp and try again in the morning, couldn't she? She could, but instead, let's go back down together. Now, she doesn't miss a beat. At the end of the day, Roman and I have always climbed together. Would I leave him here, just so I don't fall behind in the women's race to the 8,000 thirds? No, I say no. With Romano's condition worsening by the minute and the loss of daylight by the second, they set up camp on the spot on the side of the mountain. It was a grueling night, but the next day, Nives loads her backpack with all of Romano's equipment. He is too weak to carry anything. Will he still be able to descend? Will we be able to descend on our own? After several hours of a painfully slow descent, they finally reach base camp. Nevis calls for a rescue helicopter and gets some news that makes her heart sink. None are available. They have to descend the last few thousand meters on foot. Every step was an achievement, but escape was our only hope of victory. The strength is draining out of Romano with each step. He's finding it hard to breathe. 
It takes them four days to get down from the mountain and back to Kathmandu. Romano flies home to Italy, where he is diagnosed with a rare and life-threatening condition called aplastic anemia, similar to leukemia. What follows is a long and heartbreaking recovery. There were two bone marrow transplants. And then, after all the therapies, additional operations were also necessary. It will be five years before Romano fully recovers, and the pair claim another peak. Davis has made a commitment to only climb alongside her husband. As such, his illness has put her out of the running. I'm Joanna Jolly. Back in the 2000s, I was a reporter covering this remarkable story in the pool. And I'm Kathy Carlin, a rock climber and podcaster. When Joanna told me about these... I knew I had to be a part of the team telling this tale. This is Chasing Mountains. Episode 3. The Final Peaks. May 2009 is a busy month, and Kanchenjunga is a busy mountain. A few days after Nevis and Romano abandon its slopes, Adorne Passavan makes this her 12th. While on the very same day, Miss Go, climbing separately, claims her 9th. Miss O, having already climbed Kanchenjunga, is now on her next peak, number 11. This means four out of the five climbers attempt Kanchenjunga in a matter of weeks. In a collective challenge spread over a decade, carried out by five different women with differing approaches to tackle 14 separate peaks, that's quite the coincidence. Gerlinda, though, is elsewhere. Making great headway on her 12th peak, Lotse which is nestled next to Everest. In a few days' time, she'll reach the top, bringing her neck and neck with a doornade. The race might be over for Nevis, but for everyone else, it's heating up. <laughs> Super fast Miss Go is going strong. Between May 2008 and May 2009, that's a single year, she and her climbing partner, Kim Jae-soo, knock off five 8,000ers. As someone who doesn't climb, I can't even conceive how far climbers push their bodies and how much mental resilience they need to survive in these conditions. Our sport is a risky sport. I feel very sure that some people think I am a crazy woman, that I risk my life many times. You think I'm going to continue to live. So you find something inside you to continue living until the end. For these climbers, this is in their blood. It's what they love. But when you're doing four peaks in as many months, can it really resemble the passion you set out to pursue? At the first, I was excited to finally go to the mountains I had longed for. But after I set the goal, it became my homework. I had to finish it, accomplish it. So sometimes I felt like... For Miss O, the pressure of having to just get it done is ebbing away her love of climbing. I've spent most of my climbing career chasing first female ascents. It's what drives me most. There's something deeply inspiring about opening the door for other women and to show them what we collectively are capable of. One of my proudest ascents was becoming the first woman to climb the Triple Crown at the Tennessee Wall in the U.S. As so few climbers, male or female, have even attempted it. It's a series of three routes with overhanging rock jutting out for meters and cracks big enough to climb inside. And it's this sense of competition that pushes me to meet my goals. But I'm a rock climber, and there are only so many ways to climb the same wall. 
With mountaineering, on the other hand, the variables are endless. But these variables were largely ignored by the press. They were branding it a race, and with the title up for grabs, the pressure was mounting. This, uh, this, here, Miss Go is chatting to a fellow <laughs> She just did what she wanted to do and put in the effort to learn. To me, she was amazing. She was going to Nanga Parban after the call, so we just told her to work hard. And she does. Miss Go and her climbing partner are in Pakistani administered Kashmir. It's known as the Naked Mountain because it is completely exposed to the most extreme weather. No other surrounding peak comes close to matching its stature. It's famous for its deadly drops and boasts one of the longest rock faces of any other mountain on Earth. It's Miss Go's 11th. Just one step behind the other three. She marks the moment by waving the Korean flag and taking some photos and videos. It's minus 25 degrees Celsius. That's 77 Fahrenheit. She's wearing a blue snowsuit and a pink trapper hat. We can just about make out her saying that she's so relieved to have reached the peak. It's time to start the slow and careful descent. The camera gets turned off. Then it gets turned on again. A day later. <laughs> She's saying that it's the 11th of July that they reached the peak yesterday at 7.30 p.m. She looks and sounds exhausted, and the weather seems really bad. She says there are seven of them in her group, and she's hoping for a safe descent. These are Miss Go's last recorded words. She normally called us when she got to the base camp and also when she was on the summit. Every time she told us not to worry about her, but we saw the videos and the newspapers and we knew how challenging it was to go up and down those mountains. We always told her to call us after finishing her climb. Phone does ring, but this time it isn't his sister. Kim Jesu called me and I wondered why. He said that my sister had fallen. The weather had turned and Miss Go had fallen victim to one of Nanga Parvet's many drops. Her climbing partner Kim and other teammates said she fell from a cliff at 6,000 meters. At that time, I just thought she was missing. I didn't think she was dead. I heard the news. My own 
once and then the sisters are gathered together. I cried a lot. Yes. A lot. I didn't even realize I was crying. And it started to come out on the TV and a picture was released. It was then I started to realize she could be dead. The search party was sent out, and Miss Go's body was found the following day, deep in a ravine, a kilometer below the spot she fell. My sister always told us that she would never die in the mountains. She told me that we were built for her. She said that she found it easy to breathe there because she and the mountains were a good fit. It may be that the pressure of this race may have contributed to her death, but on the mountain, you can never tell. And that's why I say that when you're climbing a mountain, I think it's essential you block out any thoughts that distract you from your primary goal, which is, above all, to stay alive. Because we are at the mercy of the mountain itself, and the risk of avalanches from bad weather. We are also put at risk because we are just not designed to live in these environments. As climbers, we know we're taking risks all the time. We're pushing ourselves to extremes and getting into the same situations where we know others didn't survive. We walk into it with our eyes open, but also our hearts. Because for every one risk we know we're taking, there are a hundred life-affirming memories to be captured. By July 2009, everything has changed. There are three contenders left, Galinda, Adone, and Miss O. They are all neck and neck on their 12th peak. The following month in August, Miss O steps into the lead when she claims her 13th. It's the start of the season, April 2010. Miss O is in the lead on 13th. But Adorne quickly draws level, climbing Annapurna in Nepal. They are now neck and neck, but Miss O has the advantage, as Annapurna, the mountain they're currently on, is her final peak. And any day now, she's going to ascend it. Adorne knows she'll need to move quickly if she truly wants a chance at the title. Adorne and her team pack up, wish Miss O well, and leave her at Annapurna Base Camp to wait out the weather. They make up time by getting a helicopter back to Kathmandu. Yes, a helicopter. And after a few days rest, Adone is ready to scale her final peak. They cut out another leg of the journey by getting a jeep 5,000 meters up to the base camp. They're on Shishapangma, no friend to Adone. This is her fifth time on its slopes, after four previous unsuccessful attempts behind her. It seems she has left the toughest one until last. But against the odds, she still has a shot at getting her name into the history books. The weather might be kind to them. They might have the climb of their lives. And if Miss O gets held up somehow, that could buy them some time. But where is Miss O? A few days after meeting Adone at base camp, Miss O sets off to make an attempt on Annapurna, her final ascent. This is big news for South Korea. A crew from the country's main TV channel is hot on her heels. 
In their footage, she is covered head to toe in an orange and red snowsuit. Hood up, icebreaker mask on, not an inch of skin showing. The sky is blue, good news, but the wind is fierce. We can see her in front, striding on and up. She's looking confident. Meanwhile, two mountains over on Shisha Pegma, Adurne and her team have just arrived at base camp. Immediately, her phone rings. The bad weather coming. Really bad weather. Due to worsening conditions, they've been advised by the team's meteorologist to hold off trying to summit. And before she can take a breath, Adorne looks at the phone. What now? The camera is following Miss O as she struggles to climb an almost vertical wall of rock covered in snow and ice. She stops at what looks like the top of the wall. She turns to look down at the camera, Korean flag in hand. I was so exhausted when I stood on top of Annapurna. I thought I would roar because it was my last climb. I wanted to, but my voice just didn't come out. On the 27th of April 2010, Owen Sun of South Korea became the first woman to claim the honor of having climbed the 14 highest peaks in the world. After 13 years, several jobs, countless sponsorships, and a lot of probably unfair media criticism, she did it. Half standing, half slumping on the snow-covered peak, exhausted and struggling to hold up her flag, Miss O oh says in Korean that she's so happy and wants to share her joy with the South Korean people. The camera comes in for a close-up. Her voice thick with emotion. She tells her mum and dad she misses them. I was relieved. I was like, okay, I've finished my work now, so I finally might be able to get back my love of climbing. I remember that moment when the news arrived to the base camp and they, they say, okay, Miss, Miss o already finished. Phones start ringing off the hook. It's a stream of journalists asking how Adorne feels about losing the race. She pulls herself together and drafts a statement, a response for the media congratulating Miss O. And then... So I close the phone and I say, we don't need more news from outside. We need to think it in our challenge. We need to think it in that moment. So don't listen what's happening outside this moment. In true Edurne style, and with the voices of every one of her supporters ringing in her ears, she picks herself up and powers on to complete the mission she set out to do. It's an incredible day for my last day without summit. And when they summit? I listen to people from the base camp of my walkie talkie. She briefly turns her head in the direction
direction of Shishapadma, where only six days ago, Adone was celebrating. And Annapurna beyond the South Korean flag. She takes a breath and begins making her way down. Holly would normally congratulate the climber, wish them well, and let them go off to celebrate. But that doesn't happen here. Miss Holly asked Miss O to stay seated. She wants to talk about another of her climbs, one she did a year ago. Her 10th 8,000er, Kanchanjunga, on the border of Nepal and India. The only photo she produced shows her standing all wrong. That is not the same. She thought she'd sunk into it. The answer, it was not so clear. She agreed that she was not standing in snow. This O is about to come under a media spotlight that will see her life turned upside down. An investigation is launched. That's next time on Amazing Sports Stories. Chasing Mountains. Amazing Sports Stories, Chasing Mountains, is a bespoken production for the BBC World Service. For more episodes and extended versions, go to the Amazing Sports Stories podcast. bbcworldservice.com Or just search for Amazing Sports Stories wherever you get your BBC podcasts. World Service with an inspirational Turkish football team. In 2023, Antakya was almost wiped from the map in a devastating earthquake, but their football team vowed to keep going. But we want to do our best to make people of Atlas smile again. But can the team that emerged from the rubble avoid relegation too? Shake your goalposts Thursday at 8.30 and 19 GMT or listen now wherever you get your BBC podcasts. In half an hour, join Claudia Hammond for Health Check. We'll be asking what the rest of the world can learn. Wave which killed more than 100 people and led to over 40,000 suspected cases of heat stroke. The newsroom is next. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. It's one o'clock GMT. You're listening to the newsroom with me, Paul Moss. Donald Trump has been shot while addressing a campaign rally in Pennsylvania. A number of shots were heard when he was a few minutes into a speech. Take a look what happened. <laughs> the former president was bundled off stage and evacuated from the scene. There were yells and screams from the vast crowd. 
This woman was close to the scene when it happened. All of a sudden, we heard a bunch of shots and people started running, tripping, falling. President Joe Biden said everyone should condemn the shooting and that he hopes to speak to Mr. Trump later. We'll be bringing you the latest news from our correspondents in the U.S. and ask what this means for a U.S. election campaign which already look like no other in American history. And we'll have reaction from Wisconsin, where the Republican Party convention is set to begin. All of that after this bulletin of international news. Hello, I'm David Harper with the BBC News. Donald Trump has been rushed to safety at an election rally in Pennsylvania after a series of gunshots were heard. Secret service agents ran onto the stage to protect the former president. He raised his fist to supporters as he was led away. In the past few minutes, Mr. Trump has made his first comments since the incident. He said he'd been struck with a bullet that pierced his upper ear. He said it was, incre it was incredible that such an act could happen in the United States. Our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, was at the rally. We were a couple of hundred meters away. We were about to go on air. We suddenly heard this volley of shots from maybe 150, 200 meters away. And you had no idea where the shots were coming from. And the screaming started from inside and people started streaming out. A number of eyewitnesses here described to us their belief that the shooting was coming from a metal one-story building with a white roof to the right of the stage as Donald Trump was standing. And certainly one eyewitness we spoke to had said that he saw a man climbing onto that roof. Five, seven minutes, he said, into Donald Trump's speech, climbing up the side onto that roof with a rifle. And a couple of minutes later, the shooting started. The Secret Service says the attacker was killed as well as a member of the audience. President Biden said he was grateful to hear that Donald Trump was safe in a televised address. There's no place in America for this kind of violence. It's sick. It's sick. It's one of the reasons why we have to unite this country. We cannot allow for this to be happening. We cannot be like this. We cannot condone this. The Trump rally was a rally that he should have been able to be conducted peacefully without any problem. But the idea, the idea that there's political violence or violence in America like this is just not heard of. It's just not appropriate. We, everybody, everybody must condemn it. In other news, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said there's no on Saturday was successful in killing two of the top military leaders of Hamas. According to the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza, 90 people were killed in the attacks. From Jerusalem, our correspondent Lucy Williamson has this report. The injured were carried away in blankets and carts. Black smoke from the explosions still funneling into the sky behind them. The dead, wrapped in white shrouds, packed high inside an ambulance. Paramedics mingling with the fleeing and the grieving. Eyewitnesses told the BBC that a large airstrike hit a building in a designated safe zone for displaced people. An Israeli military official said it was a precision strike based on accurate intelligence. The Palestinian Ministry of Health said half of those killed in the strike were women and children. Lucy Williamson reporting from Jerusalem. This is David Harper in London, and you're listening to the latest world news from the BBC. The leading Islamist party in Tunisia, Ennahda, says its secretary general has been detained by police. It was not immediately clear why Ajmi Harimi was taken into custody, but there has been a recent wave of arrests targeting dozens of journalists, lawyers, and political opponents of the hardline president, Kais Syed. A lawyer for the family of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer who shot dead on a US film set three years ago, has condemned a judge's decision to dismiss the case against the actor Alec Baldwin. Gloria Allred said she remained determined to hold Mr. Baldwin accountable for his actions in the civil courts. On Friday, the judge threw out a voluntary manslaughter charge against him. Britain's new Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, says measures to secure economic growth will be at the centre of his government's agenda for the year ahead, which will be announced on Wednesday. More than 30 bills will be set out in what's known as the King's Speech. Our political correspondent, Ian Watson, reports. The new project will feature prominently the creation of a new publicly owned company, GB Energy, a national wealth fund to invest in new technologies, and to be a consultation on whether new solar farms should be regarded as critical national infrastructure. This will speed up the planning process. There will be legislation to enable water companies in England to be put into special measures, putting 
executives would be denied bonuses. There are no plans to rationalise the water companies, though most rail companies will gradually return to the public sector. With the legislation to encourage house building and an education bill to ensure that schools no longer provide breakfast clubs and measures to tackle antisocial behaviour. US media say the celebrity fitness instructor Richard Simmons, known for his flamboyant style and relentless enthusiasm, has died. He was 76. Police have not officially confirmed his death. Richard Simmons rose to fame in the 1980s and 90s with his dance workout videos. He had just celebrated his birthday on Friday and revealed earlier this year that he'd been diagnosed with skin cancer. BBC News. You're listening to the newsroom with me, Paul Moss. There was already keen interest in Donald Trump's Saturday afternoon rally in the city of Butler, Pennsylvania. It had been speculated he might name his running mate the candidate to be vice president ahead of next week's Republican Party convention in Milwaukee. And then there was the question, would the former president have anything to say about the current holder of the office, Joe Biden? But instead, 10 minutes into his speech, this happened. And you know, that's a little bit old, that chart. That chart's a couple of months old, and if you uh, want to really see something that's sad, take a look at what happened. then taken away in a waiting vehicle. Among the supporters left behind, there seemed to be a mixture of anger and defiance. The presidential bodyguard, the Secret Service as they're known in the US, have said that one member of the audience at that rally was killed, two were injured, that the suspected shooter had been neutralized. Our correspondent Gary O'Donoghue was covering the rally when he heard the gunshots and took cover behind a car. Soon after, he spoke to supporters of Donald Trump and asked them what had happened. We were listening to him talk, and all of a sudden, from my left, we heard a bunch of shots, and people started running towards us, so we just took off. People were, you know, running, tripping, falling. We just ran until we were across the street. I was about 50 feet from the president and I noticed three shots were fired. I saw white smoke and then of course everyone was very panicked and went down immediately. I saw that there was a large speaker uh, which fell immediately and then suddenly all over the president were secret service etc. Did you see, did you get any impression of where the shots were coming from? I think that they were coming from that building right there. There's something near there. And that's outside the perimeter of the, the event itself, right? That's right, it's outside the perimeter. Right. And what did you do when you heard the shots? Well, I just sort of collapsed onto the ground and hid. But there were so so many rumors. Uh, people were saying that President Trump was in the year. People were afraid that President Trump was being pulled off to the ambulance. You saw him jump, drop to the floor. Yeah. The Secret Service jump on top of him. So did he did he go to the floor on his own, or did they put him on the floor? He, he went on his own. He went on his own. Okay. Yeah. I think if Trump wouldn't have turned, he would have taken a shot right to the head. But he got the shot to the ear. So he turned at that moment? He just happened to turn at that moment and got the shot to the ear because he put his hand up to his ear. So and he, that's he what kind of gra might have grazed. He well, grazed him. We just don't know, do we? But I have pictures of the blood right. on the side of his head. Right. That was, we were right in the front row. And did you, I mean, did you, but is it possible to know, did you get a sense of how many shots were going maybe in five together? I think six or eight. Yeah. Somewhere right around we, there. Yeah. We noticed a guy crawling, bear crawling up the roof of the building beside us, 50, 50 feet away from us. So we're standing there, you know, we're pointing, we're pointing at the guy crawling up the roof. And he had a gun, right? He had a rifle. Right. We could clearly see him with a rifle, absolutely. Um, we're pointing at him. The police are down there running around on the ground. We're like, hey man, there's a guy on the roof with a rifle. And the police are like, huh, oh, what? You know, like, like they didn't know what was going on. You know, we're like, hey, right here on the roof, we can see him from right here. We see him. You know, he's, he's crawling. And 
next thing you know, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why is Trump still speaking? Why have they not pulled him off the stage? I'm standing there pointing at him for, you know, two or three minutes. Secret Service is looking at us from the top of the barn. I'm pointing at that roof, just standing there like this. And next thing you know, five shots ring out. So your, your uh, shots came from that guy on A hundred percent. Hundred percent. And he, he was up there for a couple of minutes. He was up you there. You saw him up there for a couple of minutes. Absolutely. At least three to four were, minutes. And you were telling yep. the police. We were telling the police. We were pointing at him for the Secret Service. We were looking at us from the top of the barn. They were looking at us the whole time when we were standing by that tree. Did they see? Binoculars. Did they see? Probably not, because the roof, the way the, the slope went, he was behind where they could see. But, but why is there not Secret Service on all of these roofs here? You're, you're pretty sure they, they, they shot the guy. Absolutely. 100%. That's the sad thing about this is this is not our country. But if this is a political game, this stuff's got to stop. It does. It is, this is ridiculous. You know, you, you, you win a fair and square. I can hear you're really emotional. Yeah, I'm it's just... Surprised. I got kids that yeah. I, I got grandkids that has to grow up to this. You know, I don't want... I've been to third world countries. I don't want that from here. Well, as I said, those eyewitnesses were speaking to correspondent Gary O'Donoghue. After talking to them, he gave this update. This is a massive crime scene. That's what this is. Uh, what we've had is what looks like, what looks like an attempt on Donald Trump's life. Uh, that's what the initial evidence would suggest that we've gathered from eyewitnesses. We certainly spoke to people who had seen people, a couple of people put, put in uh, ambulances. Uh, we spoke to several eyewitnesses that identified what they said is the position from where the, the shooting took place, which is a, a single story building, which is to the right of the stage as Donald Trump would have been on stage to his right. Uh, and one of our eyewitnesses, Tim, who we spoke to, said he saw, he saw a man crawl up onto that roof with a rifle and that he pointed this out, he, said, he says, to the Secret Service and to the police who were around. He said he saw this for a couple of minutes before the shooting started at 6.14 local time. So lots of questions there. He also told us that he'd seen the man killed by the security services here. Uh, we don't have any detail about what happened or, or how that happened, but another one of our eyewitnesses, uh, Colby, who's uh, just a teenager, said he saw the snipers on the other roofs around here, Secret Service, people like that. He saw them shoot, saw the muzzle flashes as they shot back at, the, at what appears to be, at this stage, the lone gunman. So there's a lot of details still to work out. We know from all our eyewitnesses that Donald Trump seemed to go down after the shooting started. We, we were actually pretty much on air, and I heard what sounded to me like six or eight shots a couple of hundred meters away, and it was absolutely clear immediately that it was shooting. Sometimes you wonder about cars backfiring, about motorcycles backfiring. This was clearly gunfire, and there was a, a rapid sort of volley of a number of shots, six to eight, I estimate, that I heard. Um, and then you heard the screaming and you heard people rushing and saw people rushing out from there and, and trying to get away as, as quickly as possible. We were on air, as I say, and we lay down on the ground to make sure because we had no idea where the shooting was coming from physically, whether it would continue, how much there was, how many people were involved. We had no idea whatsoever. So the safest place is always on, on the ground when those things are happening. And to be honest, it's quite shocking because Lots of people we've spoken to today, whether you agree with their political views or not, they came here to see their candidate. One man I spoke to, Devon, who's a local farmer, lives just two miles down the road. This is the showground where he brings his animals to sell. He's going to be here in a couple of weeks' time. It's his first rally. He says he's a proud gun owner, but he said there's some lunatics out there. And you could hear in his voice a concern about the future of his son, Colby, who was standing right next to him. What an experience for that young man at his first ever political rally in the most developed country in the world to see people shooting up one another. It's a sad, sad day for this country. Gary O'Donoghue. Just before we came on air, Donald Trump wrote on his Truth Social website, 
He wanted to thank the US Secret Service for their rapid response and his bodyguards. He added, I want to extend my condolences to the family of the person at the rally who was killed, but also to the family of another person who was badly injured. It is incredible that such an act can take place in our country. Nothing is known at this time about the shooter who is now dead. I was shot with a bullet against the upper part of my right ear. I knew immediately that something was wrong, that I heard a whizzing sound of shots, and immediately felt the bullet ripping through the skin. Much bleeding took place, so I realized then what was happening, and Donald Trump ended with his trademark in capital letters, God bless America. Well, in the past hour, speaking at the White House, President Biden has condemned the shooting. There's no place in America that's kind of wild, sick, sick. It's one reason why we have to unite this country. We cannot allow for this to be happening. We cannot be like this. We cannot condone this. And so I want to thank the Secret Service and all the agencies, including the state agencies, that are engaged in making sure that people, and we have more detail to come relative to other injured, other people maybe injured in the audience. I don't have all that detail. We'll make that available to you. We may be able to come back a little later tonight, but we'll put out a statement if we don't. If I'm not able, if it's not inconvenient for you all. The bottom line is the, the Trump rally was a rally that you should have been able to be conducted peacefully without any problem. But the idea, the idea that there's political violence or violence in America like this is just unheard of. It's just not appropriate. We, everybody, everybody must condemn it. Everybody. I'll keep you informed, and if I am able to speak to, to Donald, I'll, I'll let you know that as well. So far, it appears he's doing well, number one. Number two, that there's thoroughly investigating what happened to anyone else in the audience. I have some, we have some reports, but not final reports. And every agency in the federal government out here, I'm not going back to, to my phone to speak with federal agencies who may put together again to give me an update, a briefing, and then they have They've learned it more in the last couple of hours. So thank you very much, and I hope I get to speak to them tonight, and I'll get to back to you if I do, okay? And that was President Biden speaking within the last hour from the White House. As I said earlier, that rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, came ahead of next week's Republican convention, where Donald Trump's due to be officially designated as the party's candidate for the presidency. It's from that rally, the rally in the Butler, sorry, and it's from that Republican convention that our correspondent Nomia Iqbal joins me. Nomia, first of all, I wonder what you made of Donald Trump's comments uh, on his own social media site. Yes, it was interesting because he, uh, you know, straight away was on his network site and giving those that reaction. I think, I think Donald Trump's whole kind of approach to this is projected strength, and this is something that his supporters really love about him. Because even when he was on stage, what struck me was the Secret Service was, was, was trying to rush him off, and he and he did that fist pump, didn't he? And we're seeing all these photos now, which I think are photos for the ages, really, a real historic moment in US political history of him looking defiant, and we saw uh, that, that same attitude uh, being channeled on his uh, social media posts. Uh, it was interesting also listening to President Biden there. I don't think I've heard him refer to Donald Trump as Donald before. Often, uh, President Biden doesn't even refer to him by his uh, by his full name. Uh, but to call him Donald and to say I will hopefully speak to him later, I think what we're seeing is that you know, all the reaction from the Democratic Party has been one of unity and it's really coming out and uh, condemning what's happened to to Donald Trump. Barack Obama released a statement, Bill Clinton, also Jimmy Carter, George W. Bush, of course he's a member of the Republican Party. So there's real unity being shown by, you know, across the board. Of course there are some uh, parts of the Republican Party who are much more to the right and uh, very, as, as they describe it here, very MAGA, very loyal to Donald Trump, who are accusing the Democratic Party and uh, the, the same divisive here, the political language of somehow being responsible for what happened this evening. Uh, but, That's extraordinary. Uh, look, as you mentioned, people, I'm here at the National Convention. No, yeah. sorry, people actually blaming sorry, the Democratic God. Party already for what had happened, people from within the Republican Party. You have J.D. Vance, who is a senator from Ohio. He is, he is really tipped to be Donald Trump's 
vice president choice um, and we'll find that out later this week at the republican national convention and he has said uh, that uh, he has blamed the rhetoric uh, coming out of the the democratic party uh, the, the the language being used by the democratic party to describe donald trump as being responsible for this you know it's worth mentioning that the republican party is not innocent in any of this either when it comes to using political rhetoric, we have seen that. So Donald Trump, there won't be a lot of sympathy for Donald, for Donald Trump, I should add, by a lot of people in this country who do not like him. It's so divisive uh, here. Uh, but they, as I say, there have been these, these, these members of the Republican Party who are now coming out and blaming the Democrats for what's happened. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is uh, a congresswoman from Georgia, very loyal to Donald Trump, seen as very radical, described as far right and so forth. She has blamed Democratic Party and the media. Uh, my colleague uh, Bernd de Busman, who's in uh, Pennsylvania, who's at, who was at that rally, uh, has been reporting on our live page about the, the criticism that the media has been facing by a lot of Trump supporters there as well, who, who blame the press for a lot of divisiveness. So, yes, there is, for the most part, unity and condemnation of what's happened, but already you're seeing that, that, that sort of divisive rhetoric come up. Uh, which is not too surprising in a country that's just been so polarised for, for years now. Nomi Iqbal in Milwaukee, thank you very much indeed. You're listening to the news from, from the BBC World Service. Reminder of the main story we're covering. US Secret Service agents have rushed onto a stage to protect Donald Trump after a series of shots were heard at an election rally. The former president was taken away with blood on his ear. He later thanked the Secret Service for their rapid response. President Biden has condemned the violence and said he was grateful Mr. Trump was safe. Well, former Secret Service agent Charles Marino has been telling the BBC's Carl Nasman what measures are in place to deal with a situation like this. Former President Trump has a high level of security for two reasons. One, he's a recent former president uh, out of office, and he's also the presumptive Republican nominee here one week before the Republican convention. So he carries a lot of resources around with him on the security side. And here at this site, you've got three layers of security. You've got this inner bubble that you saw respond to the shooting and to the former president to shield him from additional gunfire. You have a middle perimeter, which also includes screening everybody that came into that rally for things like weapons, which is why I find it interesting we're not hearing exactly where this shooter was. We've heard from several eyewitnesses that have told the BBC that they personally saw somebody on a roof on a building near where this outdoor rally was taking place, somebody with a rifle. We can work to verify, obviously, those reports, but multiple people have told the BBC that. If that is indeed the case, what does that tell you as a Secret Service expert? What kinds of plans are in place for somebody who might be outside the event? Because obviously within the event, there is an incredible amount of security. Is it the same for buildings around an event? Yeah, it is, which is why the former president, you hear many eyewitnesses at the scene describing seeing the Secret Service counter snipers on nearby roofs. And you know what? That does not sound odd to me, what you're describing of where people have told news reporters where they saw somebody because if you look at the rate of gunfire that you can hear there's only what appears to be one hit what that tells me is that it was a greater distance involved of acquiring the target being the former president and having you know somewhere to six to seven misses and only one hit but there are countermeasures in place to have to catch these types of things and in this case, it appears they may not have worked, but I can tell you the FBI is going to come in. The FBI is going to lead the investigation because this was an assassination attempt. The Secret Service will hand over the investigation to the FBI. They will stay a part of the investigation. And this rally area and, and the location of where this shooter was now becomes a crime scene and they will work it exactly as a crime scene. They will interview witnesses, and they will look for ballistics, and all the other things that are associated to make the case of, of what possibly went wrong here. 
Charles Marino speaking to the BBC's Carl Lassman. Let's remind you now what happened a few years, a few hours ago at the campaign rally in Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump was rushed off stage after shots were fired. It happened just 10 minutes into his speech. And you know, that's a little bit old, that chart. That chart's a couple of months old, and if you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Biden has now condemned the shooting. There's no place in America for this kind of violence. It's sick. It's sick. It's one of the reasons why we have to unite this country. We cannot allow for this to be happening. We cannot be like this. We cannot condone this. The idea that there's political violence or violence in America like this is just unheard of. It's just not appropriate. We, everybody, everybody must condemn it. Well, let's speak now to our correspondent, Tom Bateman, who's in Washington. Tom. This has already been the most extraordinary election campaign that I could remember in American history. We've had one candidate, Donald Trump, convicted of a felony uh, during the campaign. We've had the questions about Joe Biden's fitness to carry on, uh, to even carry on as president, let alone carry on for another four years. I, I know it's early to speculate, but what do you think the effect might be of this, the, the introduction of violence now into the campaign? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, this has been a campaign of the unprecedented events that, uh, that you've spoken about already with uh, Donald Trump's um, convictions on 34 felony counts in uh, New York earlier this year. And in fact, it was only uh, less than a fortnight ago now that the Supreme Court had ruled that presidents or former presidents, when they're carrying out official acts, can have immunity from prosecution. And that had led to a delay in uh, the sentencing of Donald Trump. In fact, it was due to happen, if memory serves correct, two days ago on the 11th of July. Uh, that was, that's now been knocked back because of this uh, legal change by the Supreme Court with his lawyers having challenged that. So, you know, the campaign uh, was already in this sort of very febrile place of fending off um, his legal woes with uh, three other uh, uh, three other cases due to go ahead, um, and at the same time, a political crisis in Joe Biden again uh, unprecedented for him at this stage uh, in a in a race with his party effectively in the process of pulling the rug from under him as the nominee. That that is ongoing, and now this this moment of extraordinary violence towards not just a former president but one running for office again at a campaign rally and as we know at least one fatality now confirmed by the police in the crowd the, the shooting himself and killed um, by uh, secret service uh, Donald Trump wounded um, so where this goes we don't know but I think it's really telling Paul how you know you look at the by the sort of bipartisan nature at the moment, the, the flood of calls for calm, effectively. Uh, politicians from across the political divide, uh, from the president down, saying that there is no place for this kind of political violence. But we have had the most febrile atmosphere, of course, not just in this campaign, but for the last you know, four to eight years. And so I think this takes things to an extraordinary new and pretty dark place. Tom Bateman in Washington, thank you very much. You've been listening to the news with me, Paul Moss, on BBC World Service. A reminder of the main news, Donald Trump has been shot and is said to be in a fine condition. That's it for this edition. Goodbye. This is the BBC World Service, uncovering the world's stories. The documentary brings you in-depth storytelling from teams at the BBC World Service. In BBC OS Conversations, we bring people together to share their experiences. The fifth floor at the heart of global storytelling with BBC journalists from all around the world. Heart and Soul explores personal approaches to faith. BBC Trending. We do in-depth reporting on the world of social media. In the studio, get into the mind and process of some of the world's most creative people. And Assignment brings you investigations and journeys into the heart of global events from BBC correspondents. The documentary podcast from the BBC World Service. There is a world of storytelling just waiting to be discovered. The documentary at bbcworldservice.com or wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Hello, I'm Claudia Hammond. Health check is coming up after the news.
we'll be asking what the rest of the world can learn from India's experience of a heat wave which killed more than 100 people and led to over 40,000 suspected cases of heat stroke. And the single injection which can prevent you from contracting HIV for six months. With a new trial in Uganda and South Africa showing extremely promising results, questions are turning to how quickly it can be made available to the people who need it most. BBC News with David Harbour. Donald Trump has survived an apparent assassination attempt at an election rally in Pennsylvania. Security agents rushed to protect the former president after gunshots were heard before he was led to safety with blood on his face. In a social media post, Mr. Trump said a bullet had pierced his ear. According to the Secret Service, the attacker was killed in the scene. A member of the crowd also died, and another two were seriously wounded. President Biden said he was grateful to hear that Donald Trump was safe. Televised address, he condemned the incident, describing it as sick. Mr. Biden said there was no place for political violence in America. Two former presidents, Barack Obama and George Bush, expressed their relief that Mr. Trump wasn't seriously hurt. In other news, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said there's no proof yet that Israeli airstrikes on Saturday were successful in killing two of the top military leaders of Hamas. The Hamas run health ministry in Gaza said more than 90 people were killed. The leading Islamist party in Tunisia, Ennahda, says its secretary general has been detained by police. It's not immediately clear why Adri Arimi was taken into custody. There has been a recent wave of arrests targeting dozens of journalists, lawyers and political opponents of the hardline president of Syed. Syria has told neighbouring Turkey that normalising relations between the two countries depends on Ankara withdrawing troops from its territory. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said he's considering inviting Syria's President Assad to Ankara to discuss restoring ties. A lawyer for the family of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer shot dead on a US film set three years ago, has condemned the judge's decision to dismiss the case against the actor Alec Baldwin. Gloria Alred said she remains determined to hold Mr. Baldwin accountable for his actions through the civil courts. Live from London, that's the latest. Hello and welcome to Health Check from the BBC. I'm Claudia Hammond and every week on this show we look at what's happening in the world of health. And in the many years I've been presenting this programme, it is clear that some things definitely do get better in medicine, but then other things get worse. And today is no exception. In a moment we'll be hearing about the serious threat to health and to life caused by heat waves and how more and more people are affected. But later on we'll hear about the injection which could be a game changer in preventing the spread of HIV for decades to come. And my guest today is Andrew Green, who's a global health journalist based in Berlin. Andrew, as, as someone who covers this area as well, do you find there's this mixture of steps forward and, and steps back when it comes to global health? Oh, definitely. And I think at this point, in the midst of what people are calling a polycrisis, there's real concern that we're taking a big step back. I mean, there was massive funding injections in the global health space during COVID, but those really seem to be disappearing at the moment. Well, there's lots for us to chat about with you on that later on. But we're going to start in India. The country has now emerged from a heat wave which killed more than 100 people and led to over 40,000 suspected cases of heat stroke in the past three and a half months. Now, people from lower socioeconomic groups were especially vulnerable to the heat. And as the Northern Hemisphere enters its hottest months, we were wondering what lessons can be learned from the experience in India. I asked Aditya Pillai, who's the adaptation and resilience coordinator of the Sustainable Futures Collaborative in Delhi, what it was like during the heat wave. So this summer we had a very, very, very long heat wave. So, and um, we saw temperatures approach 50 degrees, cross 50 degrees in some instances. We saw very, very warm nights. We saw an increase in hospital admissions and severe heat stroke cases. And we've seen some very good reportage over the last a uh, couple of weeks of what a severe heat stroke case looks like and how difficult it is to treat. I've seen descriptions of hospitals actually creating heat wave units to treat the numbers of people. That's right, that's right. I mean, it's, it's all about cooling patients down. So they create units with air conditioning and large bathtubs in which you can just down kilograms and kilograms of ice to try and cool the body down because the body's gone well past uh, limits in terms of temperature but I do do want to emphasize these units 
uh, human car between, right? So these are large hospitals in the national capital. For the rest of the country, an advanced heat stroke case is very, very hard to treat because for a lot of people, it's actually quite a distance away having access to this sort of advanced care. And you often think of older people as being more at risk because we know it's harder for them to, to regulate the temperature in their bodies. And not long ago, I talked about how more women than men are being affected, but who else is most affected? So one of the interesting things was we the support the other day about a security guard who spent five days, six days straight during the heat wave out on the street side where he's stationed and we ended up with a heat stroke case. And this is a middle-aged male. When you have a really intense heat wave like this, you start seeing people die across various demographic groups that we traditionally see as vulnerable, but also those that we don't. Right? If you look at India's labor force, 75% or to some estimates, about 75% of India's labor force is heat exposed in some way or the other. They don't have the income or the wealth to stay off the worst effects of heat. Right? So this includes having an air conditioner at home, being able to take a day off when you're exhausted. And heat is definitely a killer, but poverty is an even bigger killer in these cases because it just exacerbates all the worst effects. Now, I noticed a bicycle rickshaw driver who was interviewed saying, no matter who you vote for, this is a problem no one can solve. Can it be solved? Well, what can you do if people are working outside? What, what can be done to protect them? So realistically, you can try and solve the heat problem within a certain range of temperature increase due to climate change. If we hit the sort of estimates we have of how hot the Earth's going to get by the end of the century, some say about 2.6 2.7 degrees from the industrial average, that crosses all sorts of adaptation limits. Right? At that point, if you have a severe heat wave like the one we had this past month, um, there's pretty much nothing we can do to stop it. But within current circumstances, there are plenty of options to deal with this. Urban cleaning is something that's long been held as central to beating heat, but also I think reinforcing social safety nets is an important thing to like, down the law practical policy and the decrease in welfare because ultimately the only way to stop people from overexposing themselves, especially people who are highly heat exposed, is to have them have the ability to step away from them for a couple of days and that includes insurance schemes that are built specifically for heat. Now we have uh, examples from here in India, this parametric insurance scheme that's being piloted at the moment, where the declaration of heat pay pay automatically disperses a day's income uh, to uh, reassess key vulnerable populations. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the healthcare system. This is a goal to rebuild large parts of the healthcare system, especially frontline healthcare because climate risks are going to occur at places where the capacity is currently the least. Um, so that requires a huge amount of investment. And secondly, it also requires a lot of retraining and uh, thinking about climate risk differently for future governments, right? Because medical syllabi don't necessarily incorporate climate risk at the level they should uh, based on you know, current day realities and what we're seeing playing out on the ground. India has now emerged from the hottest weather, but other countries around the globe, the US and, and Europe, are now going to be entering their hottest months. Do they face similar issues in terms of the people from lower socioeconomic groups being particularly vulnerable? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is one of the great tragedies of heat especially, but climate impacts across the board. There's plenty of literature now coming from the US which shows that heat affects on white categories. Your racial line, just as in India, he has an effect on groups that have previously been underserved and underprivileged, right? And this is true across the board. Wherever there's a social cleavage, it's important to remember that people who have been historically deprived are the people who are the most affected by these things. And is this an issue where countries can learn from each other when it comes to strategies for what to do or is every country going to need to have a very individual plan? 
No, absolutely. I mean, all the solutions I described earlier are solutions that countries have developed in isolation, but then other countries and you know, policy makers in other countries have looked at these solutions and said, okay, that's something we can use here. So there's a lot of learning between geographies, which is an extremely hopeful thing. The policies we need to put in place to make societies more regions again are pretty much the same across the world. But what differs uh, dramatically is the ability to implement the, the sort of capacity, the finance, the knowledge that's required to implement these uh, solutions. And I think that's going to be a major driver of future economic inequality between the global north and the global south. Aditya Pillai talking to me from New Delhi. Andrew, it sounds as though there is ever such a lot to think about when it comes to the health consequences of climate change. Right, and I think you're finally starting to see some serious action in this space. At last year's United Nations conference on climate change, you finally saw health really closely integrated into that agenda. We're still waiting to see whether that will translate into additional funding for adaptation in the health space, though, which I think a lot of people have their eye on. Now, I want to turn to HIV now. Masses has been done in the past two decades to save the lives of people with the virus and to prevent people from contracting it in the first place. And some of that work in more than 50 countries across Africa, Latin America and Asia has been funded by the US government through something called the President's Emergency Plan of AIDS Relief, known as PEPFAR. But just a few days ago, the Biden administration announced plans to cut it by 6%. So, Andrew, tell me, what exactly does this fund do? What's it been doing? Well, so PEPFAR has really been the backbone of not just the U.S.'s response to HIV, but really the global response to HIV. Um, I mean, the program has saved more than 25 million lives since it was launched two decades ago. And that's by spending money on both treatment and prevention programs, especially for groups of people who are often overlooked in the global response. So that might be marginalized populations like men who have sex with men or commercial sex workers. But uh, it's also a lot of funding to do HIV prevention and treatment work for women and girls who are at-risk populations in a lot of countries as well. Now this is clearly important work, but in a way 6% doesn't sound like a huge cut, but what impact might that have? Right. I mean, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem so significant, except for the fact that when that gets translated onto the ground into countries that don't invest a lot in their own HIV response, then it, it is pretty significant. And a lot of that money is going toward these key population groups like men who have sex with men. And you're seeing pretty enormous proposed cuts to those programs. So, for instance, in Burundi, the program for key populations is looking at a 29 percent cut, according to the initial estimates. And that's in a country where the president has called for homosexuals to be stoned to death. So you can imagine that men who have sex with men and other members of the LGBT population probably don't feel comfortable seeking out health services in, in government facilities. So, I mean, that cut could have enormous consequences for that community and beyond. But were you surprised to see that the Biden administration is doing this? I was really shocked to see the, the proposed cuts. This is a program that's enjoyed bipartisan support since it was uh, created two decades ago and has kind of, you know, hasn't seen major cuts in that time period. It's, it's been pretty consistent in, in the funding that's been available. Um, you've seen Biden and, and all previous presidents talk uh, pretty openly about their plans for trying to end the HIV epidemic in line with global goals. So this was, this was really a surprise. So what do people think that's about? Is it just about money? You know, it's hard to speculate on what might be driving the Biden administration's uh, agenda. A State Department official did say on the record that they've been given a flood of money that they'd had trouble spending in the past. And so the cut just reflects their capacity to, to spend the money. I, I think that will come as a surprise to a global HIV community that's looking for significant investment.